So, okay. good morning, Mr. Good morning. Trumbo. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking your time to Great. have your talk with me. Great to be here. Um, it's your first time in Stuttgart, I guess? Yes, it is. Yeah. And you came here to um, participate in FMX. Yes. And you like it? Yes, I very much. Great. We're having a great time. So, um, how did it all come about? How did you end up doing special effects or visual effects? What is your background? Well, I, I started out as a young man as an illustrator, uh, uh, kind of commercial artist, and uh, I was very personally interested in science fiction, and so my portfolio was all spacecraft and alien planets, and uh, that led me to a job at a company in Los Angeles called Graphic Films that was doing films about the space program, the American space program, particularly the Apollo program, things like that, and uh, so I got a job there, and then uh, one of the projects that came up at this graphic films was a movie called To the Moon and Beyond, which was for the New York World's Fair in 1964. And uh, I did all the illustrations and artwork for this multiplane photography, space, science fiction uh, spectacle in a big dome screen. And Stanley Kubrick and Arthur Clarke saw that film and hired graphic films and me, and ultimately I got a job on 2001. Uh, from that connection because they were looking for validation that you could make a big 70 millimeter science fiction movie but also looking for help on how to actually do it and, and make it credible. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I understand that uh, To the Moon and Beyond uh, was filmed in a process titled Cinerama 360. Correct. Um, that, can you describe this a little bit? Well, it was a, um, a 65 millimeter negative, 70 millimeter prints, and the film format was a circular film image, 10 perforations high. So it was double the normal size of a 70 millimeter frame. It was double, double your shirt, and uh, and so it was projected with fisheye lenses onto a big dome screen, um, and so it was a lot of it was photographed with fisheye lenses as well. It was all looking up, looking at the sky, looking at trees, looking at the microcosm looking at the Big Bang. Uh, so it was, a, it was a pretty spectacular movie that got me started on this whole idea of immersive cinema. So was uh, Cinerama actually involved in this project, or was it just the name? No, it was Cinerama was involved, yeah. I mean, Cinerama was still a, a, a going company, and Cinerama had offices in Marina del Rey. Uh, and we're doing a lot of projects for the fair because Cinerama was a specialist in large format 70 millimeter presentations. So they had many different kinds of cameras and lenses and, and technologies that were uh, used in many pavilions at that expo. Okay. Uh, what about the sound system on that particular? I, you know, I had I had nothing to do with the sound <laughs> system, so I couldn't I couldn't tell you. I mean, it was just some magnetic soundtrack because the, we used uh, magnetic sound on film at the time. Yes. <clears throat> so it was at least six tracks of stereo sound. So did you actually uh, work on designing the system itself? No. This was given by Cinerama? <clears throat> yes. And as you said, this led to your engagement to 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yep. Um, what was it like working with Mr. Kubrick? Well, it was amazing because he was a, a very, very intelligent, kind of genius level intellect. And he wanted to make what he called the, uh, a really, truly uh, valid and scientifically accurate uh, science fiction film. He didn't want to make what was known, you know, science fiction was kind of B-movie yes. uh, stuff of the past. And he wanted to make a really excellent, beautiful science fiction film. And he knew that that involved a lot of experimentation and a lot of development and a lot of breaking new ground. And so. That was what that whole project was about. That was what was so great about 2001 for me, particularly because it turned out that I had the right kind of qualities to be able to think kind of differently about photography, and, um, imagery on the screens, and uh, I was young and I didn't have any old habits, like you know, building props or doing special effects or anything. So um, I was able to work with him and solve a lot of challenging problems. So was uh, this all done in England? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. At Pinewood or what? Uh, no, at uh, Borumwood Studio, oh. MGM Borumwood, which the studio is no longer there. Yes. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So and, um, 
2001 uh, won an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects, yes. but I think only Kubrick was awarded with it. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, he, uh, was there a special reason why just he got the award and not like yourself? Well, <clears throat> I thought that was uh, a bit of a scandal in a way. Uh, Kubrick, uh, at the end of the movie, uh, decided to keep a, a credit for himself. And he took a credit on the film that said special photographic effects designed and directed by Stanley Kubrick, which was not entirely accurate. Yes. Uh, but also, according to the Academy rules at the time, in the special effects category, you could not have more than three individuals. And there were four of us. And so there was me, uh, Tom Howard, who did the front projection, Con Pedersen, who worked with me on the effects, who came from graphic, and Wally Evers, who did the the mechanical effects. And, uh, so they said, well, we couldn't, we didn't qualify because there was too many people. Okay. So I think it was a little bit of a scandal, but it's a, it, I think it's a tragedy that that's the only Academy Award that Stanley Kubrick ever won. Because I thought he deserved much more credit yes. than that mm -hmm. as a director, really. Yes. Um, was all the, the work on 2001 uh, done in 65 millimeter? Yes, every bit of it. Everything. Yes. And um, there was a rumor, or, or even I think there exists a photograph showing uh, um, the, the making of 2001, and you can you can spot an ultra television camera. Do you know anything about any portions of 2001 being filmed in ultra television? The, the anamorphic 65. No, no, there was none. I mean, the the cameras were the same. Mm -hmm. They were five perforation 65 millimeter negative cameras. They were owned by Panavision, and some special equipment came from uh, Lynn Dunn's company, Film Effects in Hollywood. They were rented optical equipment and special cameras, but <coughs> Ultra Panavision was only about the anamorphic lenses. Yes. And they were not used on 2001. Okay. In fact, many of the lenses used on 2001 were Nikon lenses. I see. No one ever wanted. Panavision didn't want anybody <laughs> to talk about that. And so, when was it the last time you saw 2001 on a big screen? Uh, it was maybe two or two or three years ago at the Academy in Los Angeles. We had a special screening of 2001 for the Academy, and uh, Tom Hanks and I did a whole making of 2001 two-hour show of a lot of behind-the-scenes photographs and stories. It was really a lot of fun. It's uh, one of my all-time favorites. Oh, in me 70 too. Mil. I think I've I've seen the film only in 70 mil. Good. Never, never in no a 35. Yeah, that's, the, that, that's exactly the way it should be. <laughs> yes. But it's almost impossible to see it on a 90 foot mm -hmm. sit around the screen. That's true. You know, that was a really rare experience. Yes. Unless you come to Bradford in yeah. England. Right. You're not, you're not, no, you're, uh, you know about Bradford? Yes. The Weiston weekend. Yeah. So, after your success with 2001, uh, the next thing that came along, I think, was uh, the Andromeda strain for Robert Weiss, was, yes. was it? Yes. There you did also the, the visual effects, and uh, yes. they were done in 65? No, really? no, that was all 35 millimeter. Um, we didn't, at that time, I didn't have any 65 millimeter equipment. It was a very low budget movie, uh, from our special effects point of view. So. Yes. <clears throat> Most of the work I did for uh, the Andromeda strain was uh, effects that were going to be rear projected on the screens in the laboratories. So that was 35 millimeter rear projection. Well, and then it was Close Encounters of the Flow Kind? No, it was Silent Running. Uh, okay, that's that's a film you made, made as a two, you made two films as director, which were released in German cinema. cinema. Um, Close Encounters was just for the visual effects. So, okay, but let's talk about Silent Running. Okay. Your, your first job as a director? Yes. Um, how, how did the project come about? Well, um, <clears throat> it came about through some relationships I had with friends at studios and uh, agents. And, and uh, There was a very interesting moment that happened uh, at Universal where uh, this movie called Easy Rider came out. And Easy Rider surprised everybody. It was a very profitable low-budget independent film that no one understood. Yes. The studio just didn't have any idea how to do this. And so they decided to experiment with uh, five or more films that would be one million dollar independent films. And uh, I can't remember all of the other films, but there was a Kurt Vonnegut film, uh, 
you'll probably remember. Uh, and then there was uh, the last picture show. There was silent running. Um, I can't remember the others. But anyway, they were, the whole objective was that the studio would experiment with making five or more $1 million movies and not have anything to do with them. Okay. They would put up the money, but they wouldn't see, see the script, they wouldn't have final cut, they wouldn't do anything. And so I had this amazing experience on Silent Night where I got complete control as long as I stayed on budget. And uh, so it was, a, it was a really great experience because it was a very... Uh, simple movie, it was a very low budget movie, it was made with a very small crew, it shot in 32 days, and uh, shot on board this aircraft carrier, airplane hangar, and did a lot of mini miniatures, and I kind of learned how to direct during the making of that movie. So was it due to budget reasons that it was only 185 in aspect ratio? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that was not enough money to make a big spectacle in seven millimeters. And uh, also, um, I understand uh, that there have been made uh, some demo prints available of this film. Some what? 70 mil no, prints. No, not that I know. Okay. I don't, I've never heard of that. Okay. <laughs> but, it's, but there it's, was just recently a, a restoration done in England. Uh, I can't remember the name of the company right now, but there's a really beautiful Blu ray restoration of Silent Run. It's quite okay. nice. Okay. It's really it's the best version of the film I've ever seen. It's better than the original print. Great. <laughs> so, um, the music in that film was provided by Peter Schickele? Yes. And the songs by Joan Bass? Yes. How, how did this come from? Well, um, you know, you have to remember this was the uh, early 70s. Flower children and Vietnam War and all kinds of issues going on. And, uh, I was a big fan of Joan Baez's music. I had many of her albums, and that was just part of that scene. And I noticed that I was I was really liking the orchestrations and the and the music behind her the singing. And I looked on the albums, and there was Peter Schickley, Peter Schickley, Peter Schickley. And I thought, well, I want to find someone who's not in the movie business to do something different. And so I contacted Peter. He said he'd be willing to do it. And so he came and he did the, the score for the film. And did a beautiful job, an unusual job. And then he ultimately helped me link up with Joan Baez because I wanted to hear do a song, which Peter wrote with another woman named Diane Lambert. And uh, it was a, a kind of an interesting story because she was very, very busy at that time. And she was extremely popular, traveling all over the world, performing everywhere. And Peter was calling and calling and calling, and he couldn't get a return call from Joan Baez. And just by complete freak, I was in the Chicago airport changing planes. And I saw Joan Baez get off another plane about 100 yards away. And I just went over and talked to her. And I said, I'm Doug Trumbull. I've been, we've been trying to reach you and work with Peter Shickley. Would you do the movie? She said, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> so we got it. So and did, did, she, did she do it for a, for a small budget then? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Everybody did. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it, it became some sort of a cult movie. Mm -hmm. um, for I, th I think in Germany it was only uh, released on television. I think it never made it into theaters. That's possible. So did, did it uh, in the United States, did it earn its money back yeah. theatrically? Yes. <coughs> but it was another um, business experiment that Universal tried on silent running which was to see if they could get the word, the word of mouth to carry the film rather than an advertising campaign. So they did no advertising for Silent Running, which hurt the movie very badly. Uh, so it took a long time to make its money back. It did, but it was very disappointing for me to have the movie not be promoted properly by the studio. It was another little social experiment that they were doing. And uh, I read that on that film, uh, Names like, like names like John Dykstra and also uh, Richard Juricic. Juricic, yes. Uh, yeah. Worked on that film as well. Yeah. Did they start it, their careers? Uh, yeah. It started John Dykstra's career mm -hmm. and many others that worked with John Dykstra, uh, Wayne Smith and John and Wayne and a, a whole a lot of the crew came from Long Beach State College from the Industrial <coughs> Design Department and uh, I found them and they. We hired them to build all the sets and do all the conversion of the aircraft carrier and help build the models and, and 
everything. So quite a clever mixture of a few Hollywood professionals like Charles Wheeler, who was a cinematographer and camera operator, and, uh, Gaffer, uh, Harry Sunby, who was a really good lighting man, and uh, uh, wonderful editing. But a lot of the crew that actually did the work to fabricate the movie were students. And that was, that was a great experience, and I've always believed that that's a really good way to go. The next directorial thing you did was Brainstorm, which is a long way. Right. Uh, in the meantime, you were concentrated on doing visual effects, or didn't you get any offer as a director? What no, I had many, many offers as a director. I mean, Silent Running uh, made me very popular in Hollywood for directing jobs. And uh, I went into a, a process of developing projects. So I had science fiction uh, movies in development at MGM, Columbia, Warner Brothers, uh, and Fox. And in that process of developing these projects, all of which are sitting on my shelf, unproduced, I just had all these tragic experiences happen that, that I had no control over. For instance, we had a, a really amazing uh, sci-fi adventure called Pyramid, uh, written by David Z. Goodman. It was a really terrific script, and uh, MG was going to be produced at MGM. And then Kirk Krikorian, who owned MGM, just closed the studio and decided to build a casino in Las Vegas. And so the project just ended. So that was a year of my time. Then I had another production with Arthur Jacobs, who had done Planet of the Apes. I had a big underwater adventure movie. It was kind of like a bis. And Arthur Jacobs died. Suddenly had a heart attack. And the whole project got tied up in his estate. It's bad luck. And then I had a project called The Ride. I was, I was very interested in theme park rides as, as almost a narcotic form of entertainment. Uh, as, uh, I think it was at Warner Brothers. And then suddenly all the management changed and the project got dropped. So, you know, I can't make a living. Uh, I, you know, I want to direct these movies, but they're not happening. And that was when I... Uh, talked Paramount Pictures into forming this company called Future General Corporation, which was a research and development company to look at the future of cinema technology. And that's where we invented the show scan film process, the simulation ride, uh, interactive video games, and Magic Cam. Magic Cam was this composite real-time video special effects. And so that went very well for a year of getting that started. And then all the management at Paramount changed. <laughs> Get me out of here. So um, that was when Close Encounters came along. And so Paramount um, agreed to loan me to, to uh, uh, Columbia Pictures. And I wanted to, I wanted to meet Steven Spielberg. I, you know, he had just come off Jaws, and I thought he was a really interesting director, and I thought, well, this would be cool. And it was a way to get 65 millimeter cameras. Because I said to Steven, I said, I'll do this job if we can do all the special effects in 65 millimeter. Because I wanted the cameras for show scan. <laughs> so I had a, my own agenda going on. But it was a really great opportunity to work in that movie. We developed the first motion control system and recorded camera movements on location. And, um, Richard Yurisich developed all kinds of amazing optical printing techniques to get those beautiful, soft, glowy UFOs and mothership and everything. It was a, it was a tremendous amount. Of so, what was it like, like uh, working with with the young Spielberg? It was great. I mean, Stephen Stephen was adventurous enough and uh, and powerful enough to get the studio to agree uh, to things that they didn't understand even. In those times, the budget for the visual effects on Close Encounters was high, according to what they thought it should be, and they had no idea. But Stephen managed to get the money for us and convinced the studio and the producers that we should do all this. And um, it was at a time when uh, Columbia Pictures was in a, a tremendous amount of uh, financial trouble. And if, to the, if Close Encounters had not been very successful, I think the studio might have gone out of business. It was a very, very close call. And so Close Encounters saved Columbia Pictures from bankruptcy. Maybe. <laughs> but uh, that was a really big moment when we finally showed the movie to the studio and said, oh my God, it's going to be okay. And it was, it was fun because um, 
during the production of Close Encounters was at the same time that George Lucas was, was making Star Wars. Star Wars was a little bit ahead, but it was all in the same year. And so Steve and George were talking all the time. And they, were, they were kind of competing. And uh, it was interesting because I had uh, been asked by George to do the effects for Star Wars. But I, wasn't, I was a director. I was still trying to direct projects. I, I, I said no to George because I was trying to do something else. And, uh, but after all this turmoil at, at Paramount, I agreed to do Close Encounters because I thought it was different enough and interesting enough and it fulfilled my desire. So, so George Lucas said, well, can I hire your crew? Because I wasn't doing anything at that moment. So George Lucas hired John Dykstra and all, my whole crew. And they all went to work at, at what was originally called Industrial Light Magic. Yes. And uh, they included my own father. Really? Yeah. So they did, a, they did a great job, but that was, you know, making the first Star Wars film was very tricky because uh, it was a first time for a lot of those kinds of motion control effects. And it was a very close call. They were, they were trying to do front projection for Star Wars, where they have plates out the windows of the spacecraft and things like that. Nothing worked. And it, was, it turned out to be a bad idea. And so they had to switch gears at the very last minute and go from blue screen compositing and uh, printing. And everything turned out fine, but it was a very close call. So do you reject? Uh, uh, do you uh, regret rejecting Star Wars? No, no, not at all. I'm very friendly with George. We've gotten along well over the years, and um, since it, it it became an opportunity for me to do Close Encounters, uh, everything turned out just fine. And, uh, I think my as my personal aesthetic photographically was much more appropriate for Close Encounters than Star Wars. The Star Wars, in a way, was more like the same of 2001, you know, white spacecraft with black stars. And that was kind of uh, not as interesting to me. Uh, I personally preferred Close Encounters because it was more more scientific. Uh, Star Wars is fantasy. Yeah, well, you know. Uh, Close Encounters is actually based on reality. You know the whole story about Jacques Vallée? Which one? Well, Close Encounters, remember uh, uh, Francois Truffaut plays this French UFO researcher yes. uh, named Lacan, played by Francois Truffaut. Um, I found out many years later that that was actually Jacques Vallée the French UFO researcher, who has become a good friend of mine. And that he had written many books about UFO phenomena and events that happened back in the 50s and 60s. And Spielberg read all these books and made, he wrote the screenplay for Close Encounters, based a lot on Jacques Vallée's stories, which were always sold as fictional stories. But they were true stories. If you, if you buy the whole UFO yeah. phenomenon, and uh, I think Jacques Vallée is an incredibly, uh, incredible, uh, wonderful, unbelievable uh, person who had a, a UFO encounter when he was 11 years old in France, and it changed his life totally. So he became probably one of the most, if not the most, mature uh, chroniclers of the whole UFO phenomenon to this day. So anyway, uh, that's the story of Close Encounters is real. So the whole idea of that whole story, maybe that really happened. Do you believe in UFOs? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think Close Encounters uh, influenced a lot of movies that came after it. And also television series like X-Files. Uh, you see so many elements that have been seen in Close Encounters yeah. again in this. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, a groundbreaking film. film. Well, it's one of it's one of the very unusual films that treated the whole UFO alien encounter thing as a benign exchange rather than monster attacking flesh eating monsters from Mars, you know, which is so stupid. And so I thought that it was that that a benign, loving kind of uh, amazing awesomeness that attracted me to it. And I think a lot of people appreciate it. And it's shocking to me that there hasn't been more uh, like that. I I'm intending to do more myself. That sounds promising. Ah, good. I hope, you, I hope you like it. So along came Star Trek The Motion Picture. Yeah. Uh, for Robert Weiss. Came this time in 65mm? Yes. And that came after Blade Runner. 
Didn't it? Oh. So did I get to do all the wrong? Maybe. No, no, we'll see. I'm, I, I'm losing <laughs> track of it. But uh, uh, Blade Runner came right after uh, Close Encounters. And um, the, the timing of it was that I was developing the show scan film process, the 70 millimeter at 60 frames a second, which was spectacular. And I was working with Paramount, who were enthusiastic about it at the time. And I was told to develop a feature movie that I would direct that would demonstrate this process. And that became Brainstorm. Brainstorm was written for shows we had okay. to be this experiment, this experiential spectacle. And uh, so that's what I was doing. And I was very devoted to that mission. And at the same time that that was happening, Paramount had gotten started on Star Trek The Motion Picture and were having all kinds of problems. The Herod Robert Abel's company and a lot of other people to do the special effects. I was not interested in doing the special effects for uh, Star Trek. And uh, they spent almost two years, two, a year and a half, trying to do the special effects for Star Trek. But at the same time, Paramount closed my company because they didn't believe in show scan. They didn't believe in brainstorm. They didn't believe in video games. They didn't believe in anything I was trying to do. And, but they wanted to keep me under contract so that I wouldn't go out and do something good for somebody else. And so when they got into so much trouble on Star Trek, they asked me again if I would do the special effects. And I said, okay, I will do it, but only if I can leave immediately after. And that I will take Brainstorm, I'll take ShowScan, I'll take my company and be out of my contract. Because they had a six-year contract with me. So they, they wanted to keep me out of circulation. So we made this deal. So I wasn't really too eager about doing Star Trek, but I did it to earn my way out of my country. Okay. Uh, and it was very difficult because we had no, no time left. There was uh, as many shots as Close Encounters and Star Wars combined in Star Trek. And Robert Wise had directed the movie in such a way that there was no way around it. There was no way to change the need for that many shots. There were 650 shots. It had to be completed in six months. And so, we worked out a deal for my company and John Dykstra's company, which was then called Apogee, to join forces. They were all this division and we were all 65, and we had to make an optical printer and swap. And we took separate sequences. And we all worked 24 hours a day for six months, seven days a week, maybe, around the clock, uh, to get that movie done. I hope you were paid for I was paid. I was, play, I was paid very well. It was, it was uh, nothing to complain about. But I ended up in the hospital. I, mean, it was, I was in major recovery because I was so I had ulcers and all kinds of exhaustion because I was working seven days a week, you know, almost around the clock, practically living in the studio, not getting enough sleep. It was very stressful. There was a lot of tension in the studio, and part of the tension was that uh, Paramount had been threatened by the exhibitors. Do you know this story? No. Well, in around that time that, that Star Wars and Close Encounters had been made, there was a process called blind bidding that was used largely in, well, with all theaters, but maybe even more so in European theaters, where the, the theater chains would have to pay in advance for the right to, to show a certain movie before they could even see the movie. It was called blind bidding. Okay. So that was a way for the studio to get money in advance. So the studio had received something like $35 million in advance payments for Star Trek. And they didn't like blind bidding. I mean, the, the, the theaters, they thought this was a horrible practice. They were being abused. They didn't really want to have to pay this money. They thought it was illegal, actually. And so they got the word that Star Trek was in trouble and might not be delivered according to the contract. Uh, December 7th of whatever year, 79, whatever the year was. And so the exhibitors got together and threatened Paramount with a uh, huge lawsuit. And they were going to actually close thousands of theaters around the world over the Christmas holidays if the movie didn't get delivered. And they were going to use it to break blind bidding, to make blind bidding illegal. So I was in this meeting with Barry Diller at Paramount, and he said, I don't care what this movie's like. I don't care if this movie makes any sense. I don't care if this movie is black leader. 
or has missing scenes, but we're going to deliver this movie on that day. Otherwise, we're going to go bankrupt. Okay. So if I can another big business problem, okay, all right. Now I understand what's motivating them to get this movie finished, and that's when I had a really good negotiating position. So everybody did it, and we got it done. Uh, it's not my greatest work because it was impossible to do, you know, world-shaking work in a short period of time. But we got it done. And you had fully recovered from your exhaustion. Oh yeah, exhaustion. Yeah. <laughs> Because uh, if I'm not completely wrong, uh, you went 70 back in April? Yes, you got it right. How, how do you keep up with all this new technology coming out? I'm so excited right now. I, I, it's not a matter of keeping up. It's that the technology we have now with digital cameras that can run at any frame rate, digital projectors that can run at almost any frame rate, now makes ShowScan possible, which was very difficult back then. And so I'm back. I'm trying to bring to the cinema this spectacular illusion of immersiveness, you know, the spectacle of 2001 and better than that. And um, I think it's now possible with this new uh, high frame rate, larger screens, higher reflected screens, and 3D. There's so many things now available to make a new kind of movie uh, experience, which is going to be more like a window onto reality like a, a holodeck or something at a, at a regular theater. And so I'm tremendously excited about it. And so I'm now writing screenplays for that. And I hope to get movies made. I don't want to make them all myself, but I'd like to uh, break ground on what I think will be a really powerful new kind of cinema experience that you cannot get on your tablet, computer, or your cell phone, or yes. even in a regular theater. And I think that the, the movie industry really needs a kind of a shot of uh, excitement now because people are streaming their movies and downloading their movies. And so the, the, the phrase I use now is that the multiplex is in your pocket. You know, convenience, low cost, ease of use, anytime you want anything we want. And so the rationale for the multiplex cinema, which was all about that, is now changing. And so uh, movie going attendance is at a 16 year low right now, and probably getting worse. And the theaters are very worried about it, very deeply concerned about it. There continues to be tremendous enthusiasm about IMAX. And I helped bring IMAX public two years ago. I was part of the team that bought IMAX from uh, this Canadian company, merged it with my company, raised money on the world market, took IMAX public, raised about $350 million, and brought IMAX into the commercial marketplace. So now IMAX is the only uh, current representative of spectacular giant screen cinema. Okay, so are we talking about IMAX with 70 mil? No, we're just talking about I mean, IMAX. Yeah. I mean, IMAX, whether it's 70 mil or not, they're, they're blown up movies from 35 mil here. These movies have not been made in IMAX. But Most people don't break No, the, you're talking about the, the, uh, well, the motion pictures. Uh, Even the, if not it's the travel logs, for example. I'm talking about feature motion pictures features. in IMAX. Feature like movies are blown up from 35 millimeter movies. Or if they're made digitally, they're blown up from a digital original. They're not shot in 15 or 7 yes. And there have been some sequences shot in 15 or 70, like The Dark Knight had some beautiful IMAX, it was truly spectacular. And uh, so I'm a big advocate of that. But as we all know, film is dying rapidly. Uh, the studios are not going to be delivering film prints of anything starting next year. Uh, so all the theaters have to convert to digital, including IMAX, and which is already mostly digital anyway. So it kind of levels the playing field, but it opens an opportunity to start thinking differently about what a movie can be. That's why I'm so fascinated with this 120 frame per second 3D, giant screen, very bright, um, immersive medium. So, um, I think you can tell a story in a completely different way, where the audience becomes a participant in the movie. Um, I, I once uh, saw shows and uh, it was in uh, Brussels in a multiplex. Right. They had uh, they had it for a short while, right. and I must say it was a, a very unique experience. Like uh, 
I would describe it as like a live live TV transmission. It was right. it was not film, <coughs> uh, but it's, it looked completely different. Yeah. And I think this this look um, um, makes um, trouble to some uh, cinema goers. They think this is not right. Um, do you think that we all have to change our no. uh, point of view? No, not at all. See, I think movies as they are are fantastic. It's the bedrock of, of uh, cinematic entertainment. And so 35 millimeter or 2K digital or 24 frames a second on a rectangular screen is the most common, uh, solid, great medium to tell stories. Love stories, musicals, documentary, you name it. It all works great. I'm not trying to threaten that or say you should everything should change to something else. Not at all. The nice thing about the new digital projectors is that they're already running at 144 frames a second. It's just not being used. So even when you see a regular movie in a digital theater, it's running at 144 frames. It's just the frames are being repeated multiple times. They're being flashed multiple times. And so it just looks like 24 frames. It doesn't flicker anymore because there's no shutters. But uh, it just enables me to think about ShowScan now because I don't have this problem of having to install new projectors. They're already there. So I think it's going to get rid of one of the big barriers to ShowScan. But my feeling is that that weird uh, texture of a movie becoming too much like live television is a problem. It is an issue. And so I've invented and applied for a patent on a, a, a very interesting approach to that which is that I've been shooting experimental demonstration films at 120 frames a second, where the shutter in the digital camera is at 360 degrees, not 180 degrees. So it means everything has been captured. And so if you want to take that material and reduce it to 24 frames, all you do is you blend three adjacent frames together to recover the blur that's appropriate. And then you delete the next two frames. That's three and two. That gives you the five to one ratio between 120 and 24. So you can make a 24 frame movie from the 120 master. It looks exactly like a 24 frame movie. The same blur, same everything. But any object that's moving in the scene, that's moving so fast that it starts to blur, you can actually up res that part portion of the shot. Just a football or a hockey puck or an exploding car or a chase that suddenly ramp up to 30, 48, 60, or 120 frames a second as needed only on that part of the scene. So the rest of the movie it still looks like 24. It'll get rid of that problem. Like, there's a lot of discussion now because Peter Jackson is showing 48 frame Hobbit material. Some people feel it. And I'm saying, I understand that, and I've experienced that with Showscan. I made a film called Leonardo's Dream about that 30 years ago, which was a costume period drama about Leonardo da Vinci. Yes. And it was very weird in that it felt like live theater. It wasn't a movie. It was a window onto Leonardo's laboratory. And uh, I, I concluded then that maybe that wasn't the appropriate way to go. So now I know that these uh, new digital technologies will allow a director, as they do now in 3D movies, if, if a director directs a 3D movie, some shots are a lot of 3D, some shots are a little 3D, some shots are almost no 3D. They, they can modulate the dimensionality as needed for the storyteller, which is completely appropriate. Now we can modulate frame rates as well, dynamically. Just like you modulate color timing or color grading or brightness or loudness of sound. They're all variable. And so I think it's possible to make a new kind of movie that still, for all intents and purposes, looks like a regular movie, but when some big action happens, it doesn't become a bunch of blurred stuff. If you freeze frame on your action sequences, you'll see how much is lost. Uh, blurring is a big problem, particularly on fast pans and fast action sequences, and everybody wants action sequences. Not all the time, but certain parts of the film. So it's possible to dynamically modulate the frame rate and everything. So this is totally new. Right. So this it's, it's is a also radical new idea that no one is even. I'm just talking about it for the first time right here. Um, so this also will elim eliminate like wheels turning the wrong way. Yeah. You see a car driving. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. 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 Sounds very interesting. When will we see the first film with that? Well, I'm, I'm hoping to shoot a sequence with my film. I'm working on a science fiction film that I hope to shoot in June or July. Just maybe a little five minute piece. And my plan is to <coughs> shoot it this way at 120 frames a second. Um, and then I will be able to print the film at 120, 60, 48, 30, and 24. So you can look at it that way. Okay. And we can also change frame rate dynamically on an object by object basis. And it can also be 3D or 2D. So the, the design of this idea is to make it completely compatible with every film process ever considered. Um, and see if that's a better way to make a movie. Uh, and offer something that will be that'll work just fine on your tablet and your computer and your iPad or whatever. But also offer something much more spectacular particularly on a giant screen. Because when you go to a giant screen, like Cinerama was, the displacement from one frame to the next can be several inches or several feet. And your eye can't connect that together in 20 frames. And so there's a lot of eye strain attendant to particularly large screen movies. Like you see IMAX movies, if the, if the action is too fast, it gets very hard to watch. But if you increase the frame rate, then it's great. It becomes very comfortable, and there's a lot of eye strain attended to 3D as well because of 24 frames. And so I think when people see uh, the Hobbit at 48 frames, they'll they might have a weird feeling about their realism of it, but they'll they'll notice immediately how much better the 3D is. Okay. And uh, that'll be a very interesting uh, social experiment <laughs> to see if that'll get people back into theaters. Yes. You know, it's, a, it's a big, big move in the right direction. And Jim Cameron, you know, he wants to do Avatar 2 and 3, 60 frames. Which would be shows and speed. Yeah. Well, let's say shows and analog. Yeah, right. That's fine. That's great. That brings me back to Brainstorm. Oh, yeah. Which you already said. It was intended to be shown uh, uh, in shows, then, yes. at least the, the, the dream sequences. Yes. Uh, and uh, the reason why it didn't come that way were the, the, the cinema owners who, resist, who resisted it. No, it was, it was two things. Everybody who saw Showskin thought it was fantastic. I mean, they just loved it. It was a unanimously positive response. The problem was that I couldn't get a studio to make the first film because they said, well, we would only make a film and spend a million, millions of dollars making this film unless there's thousands of theaters equipped to show it. Okay? So I said, okay, so we go to the exhibitors and we say, okay, would you like to set up theaters with new projectors? And they say, well, we would, but only if all the movies were made that way. And so it was like this catch-22 blaming the other guy, and I tried for a couple of years to make that happen. And I realized that it was just just about impossible. And that there was there was a big barrier between the exhib exhibitors at the studios. And I just couldn't make that happen. So I had to give up and agree to make uh, brainstorm conventionally. And so, and so I went 70 millimeter 35 and changed the aspect ratio and changed the mono sound to stereo sound back and forth. And I did as much as I could within the context of not having show scan. But it's been my dream for years, a long, long time, to make a movie in a process like this yes. that changes the relationship between the audience and the movie, where the audience is in the movie, not looking at the movie. That's what Brainstorm was about, getting inside someone else's head. Yes. And so we can do that now, because <laughs> the, the system's all there. Yes. The cameras are there, projectors are there, we just need to change the servers a little bit, give them a little more data. Okay. And I, I don't think that's a deal for the So did, uh, did some of the uh, some original show scan footage went into Brainstorm? No, like, never. Nothing. So no, also nothing. The, the scene with the truck on, on the road? No. Because everything was done in Super Panavision. Yeah. In that film, I especially like the music score by James Horner. Mm -hmm. Can you tell a bit about how this came, how you uh, came well, together? Uh, I can't remember when I first met James, but he was a very young man when I, when I first met him. And uh, I met him when he was working, he was working on the score for some other film, I can't remember. But we met and I really liked him, and he really liked me, and so he agreed to do the score for the brainstorm. 
and uh, we wanted to do some musical things that were uh, kind of unusual, exploratory, and uh, MGM said that's fine. And so uh, it was a, just a fantastic experience, and I'd like to work with him again. Uh, you know, uh, Steven Spielberg always worked with John Williams. Yes. Well, I'd like to always work with James Warner. <laughs> So did, was it just that one film uh, you made together? Brainstorm? Yeah, because I haven't made any films since Brainstorm. I mean, the whole tragedy, uh, tragedy of Natalie Wood dying yes. after his Brainstorm just completely uh, discouraged me. I mean, I was already discouraged that I couldn't get shows again. But then to have my actress die under various, very uh, suspicious, suspicious circumstances, I would say. Yes. Um, and I had a, an extremely challenging time to get the movie finished. The studio didn't want to finish the movie, they wanted the insurance money. And I, I was not welcome at the studio anymore. And I was not welcome by management of the studio anymore. And I'd already had so many bad experiences with studios prior to that, you know, with my development deals. I just decided I have to do enough of it, I can't take this. This is too unpleasant, and too disturbing, and too uh, worrying. And I just decided, well, I'll just have to stop directing here, and I'll go do something else. Literally, I just had to move out of LA and say, I'm going to start over again. And so I moved to Massachusetts and set up a little studio there. And uh, it didn't take long before the Back to the Future ride. And I thought, ah, this is good, because I'd invented the simulator ride at Future General years before. And it had developed into this new business, and so they were going to do this big ride. Steven Spielberg was involved with Universal in this ride, and friends of mine had been working on it, and they couldn't make it work. And so uh, I got a call from a friend who said they're looking for a director for the Back to the Future ride to fix it. And I said, I'm here. I'd love to do that. And so I talked with Steven, and I, I kind of know how Steven directs, I know how Steven thinks. And I pitched an idea for the ride that I thought would be in keeping with the trilogy of films that get produced to the Pops of Action. And that I thought would be a really terrific ride. But I also had the technical understanding of the whole simulation, the relationship of physical motion to a movie. Yes. And uh, all the fact that it was going to be IMAX projection, you know, flight simulator type of ride. And I thought that was a really interesting moment to explore this same concept, the whole idea of putting the audience inside the movie was what that ride was all about. Yes. You are in the movie. You're not looking at a movie, you're inside the movie, you're feeling the movie, you're tasting the movie, you're, it's all around you. And that was just a, a wonderful, spectacular project. It was hugely successful. Probably made a billion dollars for Universal. Played for almost 20 years in all three of their parks. And it was plain, you know, a lot of people felt it was the best theme park attraction ever made. Did you ever see it? No. Yeah, well, you had, you had to go there. There was only three places to see it. So. I have never, I've never been to the USA. Yeah. Oh, really? Well, <laughs> I hate long flights. Okay. Well, I, anyway, it was a wonderful experience, but it was also disappointing that the cinema industry that I feel that I'm part of did not recognize that the Back to the Future ride was a cinematic experiment. It was like when, when uh, Millier made the, the or the, uh, or Millier or the, or the uh, Lumiere brothers had the train coming to the station, scene, which is in the Um That was such a big moment in the cinema that it, it, so, so everybody freaked out that that was an act. So I think the Back to the Future ride for me is a big moment in cinema because it actually allows the audience to participate in the movie. Even though it's only four minutes long, it's an incredibly kinetic, powerful experience. But it was limited by 24 frames and blurring and strobing and a very dim image and all kinds of other technical challenges at the time. So uh, well, then now we can do it. There's a chance for upgrading it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they they turned it into something. You know, they turned it into a Simpsons ride. <laughs> kind of silly. It's okay, but. Um, Whatever sells. To me, it doesn't really matter. To me, there's a continuity to the theme of my work, which is to try to see if we can't get closer and closer to using the cinema to create some immersive, a powerful personal experience for the audience through direct experience rather than through empathy with the character. Yes. I just think that's a, that's an interesting challenge. 
that's what I'm all about. So I'm still trying to get there. <laughs> so the whole cinema industry is going digital now. Yep. Um, but if I'm not completely mistaken, um, you did some 65 mil on the Tree of Life. No. 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 Okay. No, so I'm mistaken. No. No. What we did on Tree of Life, and the reason, I mean, I don't hire out as a special effects guy, for but Terry Malick is an old personal friend of mine, and we're, we're contemporaries, we're the same age, we grew up as directors together, and we were talking two years ago about his passion for this Tree of Life project, and his uh, uh, disappointment with computer graphics to create anything really beautiful and organically cosmic like we did in 2001 or even Close Encounters, which were all water tank tricks with paint and high-speed cameras. And I said, well, we've got high-speed cameras that will go a thousand frames a second now, effortlessly, just like that. And what if we did effects for Tree of Life using high-speed cameras and water tanks and turbulence and liquids and flows and try to create these what I call organic effects that would be unpredictable. And he loved that idea because Terry is all about what he calls the Tao, trying to create a circumstance where something unexpected will happen during the photography. I mean, if you read about Terry's movies, you'll see that's the whole theme going on. So he's constantly, even in live action shooting, he will get his actors all prepped and everybody knows the scene, they know the story, but he'll suddenly inject some unexpected other character or situation or a disturbance in the scene to get the audiences, to get the actors to become spontaneously to another level. And so we were trying to do that with the effects. How could we get something to happen in front of the camera that none of us could even plan? And that was just a, a, a lot of fun. And uh, so uh, it's a, you know, it's an art movie, so to speak. Yes. It's not, certainly not a mainstream uh, action adventure like a Transformers or anything. It's the no. anti-Transformers. And so I was delighted that um, it was so well received. You know, and it made me uh, comfortable that there's really, I think there is still a big audience for intelligent movies, yes. thoughtful, intelligent movies. And there these, so, there certainly is. These, these superhero movies are okay. I have no problem with them, but I think there's an audience that would like a little bit more gratification, yes. a little depth, a little more uh, yes. important yes. ideas and thoughts. And, and so, um, so the science fiction project you're developing currently, this is more like yeah, such it's, thing? Yeah, yes. Uh, and I, I, I'm only, I have my own limited intelligence, but I'm trying to tell a story that I think is as thoughtful and intelligent as, as 2001 was, uh, based on scientific uh, reality, uh, astronomical reality, about space and time reality. Uh, it's not a monster movie. There's no aliens attacking. But it, but it will touch on alien contact and issues that are all starting to come up now. I mean, it's so fascinating that we have things like the Kepler spacecraft that's out there finding that there are probably a hundred billion habitable planets. I mean, that's, I mean, that's mind-boggling. And so that's scientific evidence that you can see on any book stand. Yes. You can buy Sky and Tele Telescope magazine or Scientific American or anything. You can read online that the propensity for life in the universe is enormously big. And there's some reason why we don't know about it yet. Yes. I think that's really interesting. And if you poll people in the world, most people will say that they believe there's life in the universe. But there is a big stigma attached to UFOs and aliens in the sense that uh, it's been so demonized in movies and so trivialized in science fiction movies uh, that nobody who has an academic credential will touch that subject. It's, a fun, it's an interesting thing. So astronomers, physicists, astrophysicists, people in the space program, people in NASA, they all believe in life in the universe, but nobody wants to talk about UFOs. Because if they'll lose their job. They'll lose ten years, they'll be ridiculed, it's, they'll become the laughing stock, and so no one wants to talk about it. I think it's actually a really huge and interesting story. And I'm not afraid of it, because I don't have tenure and I'm not a scientist, so I, I don't have anything to lose. <laughs> so I think it's really fun territory. This is a very fertile ground, and you can see 
hundreds and thousands of really great science fiction stories. So the deal with alien contact and other planets and the future and time travel and space-time continuum issues and quantum physics and I think it's fascinating. I think the audience is really pretty smart. Yes. And we have a more, the most technologically astute audience that has ever lived on this planet. And Hollywood treats them like they're stupid. So there's plenty of room. Yes, right. This sounds very promising. Um, so you are, um, you have the screenplay already. Yes. Now you are doing a test sequence. Yes. The show scan digital, and uh, then you're looking for fun. I don't really call it show scan digital. That's a, it's not technically the name of this thing. Okay. So I have I have an arrangement with show scan because I actually, they actually paid for some of these early tests. This whole idea of embedding high frame rates and low frame rates is the show scan digital concept. But the 3D application of it into even higher frame rates is not show scan digital. Okay. So I haven't even named it yet. It's okay. a whole different thing. I have two separate patents uh, that I've applied for just to at least have some business control over it. Yes. I've been out of the movie business for 30 years. I'm not an, an, an anybody's A-list as a director or a writer or a producer or anything. Um, but I, I am trying to reappear on the scene because I really have a passion to do something important. And because of this disconnect between the studios and the exhibitors, there's really no technological undercurrent that pins the movie business together. There's just suppliers of cameras, there's suppliers of projectors, and there are people that use them, and studios that want to sell a lot of tickets on a long weekend. And so I don't expect a movie studio to call me up and say they want me to direct a movie because I'd probably say no anyway. Um, and so I'm, I'm crazy enough to believe that we can actually um, somehow jumpstart a new, <clears throat> a new industry that's kind of, I tentatively call it this kind of idea of a hyper cinema, where you would go to a place that's not even a movie theater. I don't call it a movie theater. It's like going to the holodeck. It's like going to see Cirque du Soleil. It's like going to a theater to see a Broadway show. You know it's going to be a live event, or a circus, or something that's going to happen that's extraordinary. And so I think that we need to bring some showmanship back in. It has to be special reserve seat tickets. It has to be a spectacle of epic proportions. It's so different from anything you would expect to see in a movie theater. So it will be higher priced, <coughs> worth it, and totally different. And I don't know where the financing is going to come from. Silicon Valley or some... Uh, <coughs> billionaire who's interested in the future of space travel, I don't know. It will come from somewhere else. I hope I hope you will succeed with it. I'm trying. Because I'm, I'm excited to see it. <laughs> I, I'm so excited right now. It's, it's just so much fun. And it's, it's a really great time. So what happened, uh, there have been some uh, short uh, films produced in shows. Can what happened to the negatives and the, the sound? The no, they're all there. The Showscan has an archive of all those negatives. Oh. And um, one of the interesting things that's happening right now is that the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences wants to archive at least two of the Showscan original negatives because there was a very important film I made called New Magic, which was my first real Showscan experimental film. And uh, it's admired by a lot of people who remember seeing it because it showed for the first time that you could put something on the screen that was indistinguishable from reality. That had never been done before. Um, and I, I was experimenting with a lot of things. Like, I had, I, this was a, many years ago, but I hired Nicolette Sheridan, you know, who's been a big star on Desperate Housewives. She was very young, very beautiful, untrained, supermodel. And we hired her to look into the camera from about a foot away, like, this close and try to seduce the audience. Yes. And it was freaky. <laughs> and then I hired a hypnotist to do a hypnotic routine to try to hypnotize the audience. Yes. And we could hypnotize the audience. And we hired Ricky J, who was one of the greatest uh, card trick uh, manipulators, to do card tricks in front of the audience. Whoa. And so we were going into this new kind of direct contact kind of filmmaking experiment 
that's what the magic was all about. And um, and I did this funny scene in the magic, which which has become kind of a historical moment in movies, where I knew that people coming to see this demonstration film were coming to Doug's office to see Doug's film, Doug's screen, Doug's demonstration of Joseph. Right? That was what I knew they knew. So I purposely made a really bad movie. And so we, we shot this horrible little 35 millimeter documentary film of a kind of a firework show being set up. Terribly directed, terribly shot, terribly edited. We scratched the print, we spliced it out of frame, we ripped the perforations off one side, and then and projected it crooked and out of focus. So it was a movie of a movie. So I had a big screen, but it was just a small movie in the middle of the screen. It was bad. And then it burned. And then you hear, you, you hear this clank in the back. You, you, you see the shutter down on the projector. And then the house lights come out. But they're not real house lights. They're a movie of house lights. And then the projectionist, you hear the projectionist screaming in the projection booth that he's freaking out that he broke the film. And you hear him run around the theaters and just around town. And he opens the door behind the screen and comes up to the screen from behind with a flashlight and starts talking to the audience, explaining that he's sorry, he made a mistake, he's got another print back there somewhere, and he's kind of rummaging around. And so people like, you know, seasoned movie professionals like Steven Spielberg, as a really good example, and he's a friend of mine, came to see my demo film. And so when that happened, he got up out of his seat, shook my hand, said, Doug, you know, call me when you get it fixed. <laughs> and, and then he would start walking across, and I would just wait, you know, he's going he's to understand this in a minute. And so he would get to the door, and he'd look sideways at the screen and realize it was just a two-dimensional movie of this projectionist. And so it was, that, it was that moment that, to me, was a moment in movie history as well that you could create this illusion of something really happening live in the theater at that time. And that's, that's where I've been trying to go ever since. It's been a huge setback to not be able to do show scan, a huge setback not to be able to do brainstorm the way I wanted, a huge setback to have me to die. I just had to retrench and rethink everything. And so I've decided that now that we have digital projectors, I realized about three years ago, that these projectors are running at 144 frames a second. And I'm trying to figure, well, why, why is that? You know, because they're triple flashing the left and right eye for 3D movies. I said, well, that's way better than show scan. And it's already there. So I started talking to the projector manufacturers, and I started talking to camera manufacturers, and I said, can we go 120 frames? So oh, yeah, that's easy. Can we shoot at 120 frames? Oh, yeah, that's easy. So I've started this experiment. But it calls into question the whole cinematic language. Not that it's going to make it obsolete, it's just different. That's all it is, it's just different. So with, with the film becoming that real, have you ever been approached by military life to think like it's done in brainstorm? Actually, no, I haven't been approached. Well, I have. I, I will say I have. There are other initiatives going on, and there's an interesting crossover because I work with uh, Christie Digitals been helping with projectors. <clears throat> and I deal with a different division of Christie because it's the simulation division that makes special projectors for flight simulators and, and uh, training simulators and things like that. So there's a whole different culture of that world. And there, there has been a huge amount of recent interest in what I'm doing for training. And I'm just a little bit cautious and about training people to kill more effectively. <laughs> it just disturbs me. Yes. Um, I'm sure it's going to happen. I can't make it not happen. If it's a powerful way to go, it will. If you could train people to save lives, or live longer, or save the planet from yes. destruction, then I'm all for that. Uh, but I just feel like I need to explore what we can do with this medium. And I'm a member of a, a new uh, group called the Overview Institute. There's a thing called the Overview Effect. It's a book written by a man named Frank White. And he was interviewing astronauts coming back from the Apollo program, who all were completely, their minds were expanded by looking at the Earth from space.
And they said, whoa, we're on this planet that's in the middle of nowhere, and it's very precious, and it's very beautiful. And why are we having all these wars? wars? Why are we having, why do we have borders? Why do we fight over everything? They just came back with a completely changed view of mankind on Earth as an issue. And, and Edgar Mitchell, who was one of the Apollo astronauts, formed this thing called the Noetics Institute. And he's on the board of the Overview Institute. Our objective is to see if we can give people that kind of experience, a profound experience of our planet as a precious jewel in the, in the void, and see if that won't help change people's political views or environmental views or Solve, help solve global warming or all the other things that we're doing to basically use up this planet. You, know, you can read about things just this last month about uh, this new company called, uh, I think it's called Space Resources, which is planning to mine the asteroids. Have you heard about that? No. I mean, it's for real. I mean, these people are multi-millionaires, including Jim Cameron and some of these people who are involved in the new space movement, are planning to mine asteroids to try to get more raw materials to keep the Earth going. I mean, it's happening. So It, it, it sounds like a science fiction movie. Exactly. But, see, that's the whole thing, is that it's not science fiction, it's science fact. So I think if you can make that leap of faith and say, let's not make a movie about some experience. Let's have the experience directly. Yes. That's where I'm trying to go. And believe me, I, there is not any other producer or director or writer I can talk to about that. I'm a, I'm a so one. You're the I, pioneer. I'm the pioneer. I say, okay, that's my life. I'll just keep doing it until I do it. And so I have built my own studio. I have my own screen. I have my own stage. I have my own projectors. I have, I have everything just about ready to go. And I'm looking for um, informed, independent funding from some wealthy individual or company who uh, sees the vision of all this and sees not only the value of it but the profitability of it. I think it'll make a huge amount of money. I think it's a no-brainer about making money. But it's completely outside the mold of what producers, directors, and exhibitors think is a movie. It's another animal. So, I have, that's why I, I go around all trying to tell everybody what I'm trying to do so the story gets out and we can talk about it. I wish you every success with it. Well, I appreciate it. Being on the camera. Uh, I, I, I have to ask you something uh, else because it's something uh, uh, since the arrival of digital projection in the cinemas, everybody is talking about digital uh, can never be look as good as film. That's uh, not true. And uh, some even say it's a uh, 35 millimeter cannot be beat by digital. Also, if it's 4K, it's not enough. Uh, maybe if it's 8K, it reaches maybe 70 mil. What is your opinion to that? I completely disagree with that. Uh, having been totally familiar with 70 millimeter and IMAX and every conceivable kind of screen, and every kind of medium, I'm absolutely confident the digital is has caught up with film, but is now going to far exceed it in terms of frame rate, resolution, steadiness, brightness, color saturation, you know, laser projectors are going to. Yes. Everything is happening, which has tremendous upward mobility. The digital thing just gets better and better. Moore's law. It doubles in power every 18 months. And so that's not true of film. But film is also, <clears throat> as much as it's been a beautiful art form all these years, and I have nothing against film, It's a very polluting thing. It's a petrochemical. There's a lot of chemicals involved in the processing and making the film that's toxic. And digital is not toxic. And it doesn't take a lot of energy. And it doesn't take a lot of shipping. And so I say there's a lot of other things about it too that I like. So I've gone totally digital. I'm not interested in film at all. One of the issues is uh, will digital survive mankind? Well, it's probably. <laughs> no, because That's another good science fiction story. <laughs> because, it, well, you know, the, the data storage uh, uh, media, they are, they are not there forever. You have to, uh, to copy your files 
every five years or so. There's a lot of there's a lot of new. There, I saw at NAD just last month. I saw uh, holographic storage. So it's it's a reality. Yes. And so it has at least hundred year ar archival per perpetuity. Okay. As, as good as any photographic material ever was. There are other technologies in the pipeline now that will be archival. So that gives me some comfort. <laughs> okay. Um, but I thought you were talking about the fact that uh, you know we're, that the, the, the singularity is going to happen and we're all going to be subsumed by digital intelligence, which I think is probably the more likely scenario. <laughs> like the Terminator 2. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty weird. No, it's because people are always relying on the digital technology. They, they, they think they have to push the button, everything works, but uh, sometimes very tricky. Yeah. Well, there's a kind of dumbing down of humanity that's happened as a result of that. Because people are, are enabled by all these digital technologies that make manual labor obsolete. It's one of the big problems with society right now. There's no jobs because nothing needs to be made anymore. It's all robotic and produced. So this huge impact of uh, electronics and these technologies on keeping our world going, but it doesn't create employment. It probably won't. It's very scary. And we're overpopulating this planet way beyond its capacity. You know, there's a lot of big social issues. There is still a lot of so are there, among all the films you've worked for, uh, is there any particular film you like especially? What you I still like 2001. I still like 2001. Yeah, it was like as a as a young man, as a man now. I feel that was the most interesting movie. It touched on the deepest, most profound ideas of omniscience, omnipotence, infinity, big issues. Yes. You don't see that in the monster movie. No. And it's really sad to me that I don't see nearly enough like that. And so that was a big moment for me. It was great to be involved with it. I'm very proud of it. And it's been disappointing that things like that haven't happened more often. Yes. And I'd like to help. I'm trying to do my part to help make that happen. I think that the, there's a very intelligent audience like we're talking about that's very underserved and would love to see something more like, you know, Tree of Life. Beyond. Yes. Terry's working on another film that I'm helping out too, called The Voyage of Time, which will be more of that. But my film is much, it's different in the fact that there's a real story, but it's a scientifically informed story. Um, and there is drama, and there's plot, and there's action, and it's all kind of other stuff, but it's a very big idea. Is there already a title for it? Yeah, but I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the title gives it too much away. Okay, I understand. Um, it'll, um, I will probably talk about it sometime in the next few months. Because there's there's this other weird phenomenon these days of promoting a movie or, or letting your audience know that you're working on something and everybody wants to be involved. It's just a really good uh, kind of social media kind of thing, you know, that Peter Jackson has a blog every month about the making of The Hobbit so people can feel like they're behind the scenes and they're part of the creative process yes. and they can see what's going on. So there's nothing lost to The Hobbit by seeing behind the scenes. And um, so I think that kind of uh, social process is really good. And I'll be doing that sometime soon. Because I think that working with a major studio and, and spending $40 million on prints and ads to get people's attention is not the way to get people's attention. You get these people's attention by telling a real story, yes. not by paid advertising. And so, uh, but it's a completely different world that way. Digital media allows fewer barriers between the producer and the audience. I really like that. So we keep our eyes open for your website, for your blog coming yeah. to the website. Yeah.